it's me. I'm going to try to get through chapter three here. It's thick with detail. Um, there's a love story that begins to emerge. How exciting. Those of you who've seen or read Romeo and Juliet um, might recognize some of this plot. It's stolen from Romeo and Juliet uh, and doesn't... Um, it shares a sort of sad ending, kind of. Um, anyway, so let's go on. Again, the questions I've been asking all along. What is happening? Given the historical context, what do you think his purpose was in writing this story? Could it be seen as a metaphor for something else? If so, what? I always say, you know, always ask yourself, what is the meaning? Like, what does the author mean here? Um, what aspects of this story feel like cliches to us now? Keep in mind they weren't cliches um, so much back then. And is the story actually scary? Which parts? What makes something scary? Um, we went over chapter one. We've gone over chapter two. Again, just a reminder of all the supernatural events happening. Um, we ended chapter two with the arrival of a knight outside the castle of Otranto. And the advent of the night, the arrival of the night, um, causes the helmet to bow, as if someone's wearing it, was the image, and the sable plumes um, blow around like they're in a tempest. So the, the, the helmet is excited that this night has arrived. Think back at the prophecy from the first page. Um, let's look it up. I should probably memorize it by this point. Uh, that the castle and lordship of Otranto should pass from the present family, Manfred's family, whenever the real owner should be grown too large to inhabit it. So we're looking for large owner objects um, showing up. All right, so here we are, uh, chapter three. Again, there's a continued anxiety present about succession and legitimacy. Succession is a fancy way of saying, like, who comes next? Who will succeed you? Uh, Manfred's anxious that he doesn't have a son to succeed him, meaning to come after him. And legitimacy, this is a term, like, if something's legit, it means it's, like, um, valid or deserves its place. And a legitimate child is like an old-fashioned way of saying a child born in wedlock. Um, or legitimate heir would be someone who, like, deserves to inherit the um, castle in this case. So Manfred really wants everyone to believe he's legit. Like, he legitimately is the Prince of Otranto, but he's obviously scared because of this prophecy that everyone seems to know. Um, so this anxiety about succession and legitimacy plagues him, and it, it, it motivates his urgent need to marry Isabella and make a son. And, um, and the, the chapter opens with an accusation from the knight that has arrived that Manfred is a usurper. And you really have to know what this word means, like usurper, someone who's taken something that's not theirs. They've They've taken a position that doesn't belong to them. They've usurped the prince, uh, prince title of castle. Um, another theme that comes up a lot is these, this, these confused identities, like who's the knight? Last chapter, we found out who's this peasant? It turns out he was Theodore. Who's Jerome? It turns out he was a Sicilian nobleman. Um, Theodore is his son. Who's Manfred if he's not the true prince, according to the prophecy? Who is he? Um, this chapter also features the romance blooming between Matilda and Theodore. Ooh, we're going to look at that in detail. And we've got continued supernatural events. Um, when the knight arrives, he, he shows up with like an enormous crowd. It's a really funny parade. Um, he's carrying like a herald, which is like a symbol. If you watch Game of Thrones... Oh, by the way, that's very gothic. I forgot to mention that. You know, they all have sigils with ba like on their banners. Like how Stark has a dire wolf on a, I don't know, white background? Blue dire wolf, white background? I forget. Um, so that's like heraldry. It's a symbol of your family. And the, the, the um, 
this knight really pisses off Manfred because it, his herald, his banner, is quartered, meaning there's a, it's like drawn into quarters, and one of the um, symbols on it sort of suggests that he owns Otranto, which is very offensive. And then um, there's another... So, like, in the midst of this parade when the knight arrives, a giant sword bursts from the crowd, uh, which is ridiculous. And then later on, another supernatural thing is when Theo and Matilda fall in love, and Theo says in honor of his love for her, he won't get revenge on Manfred. Suddenly there's a groan from heaven. Um, and, you know, remember, the, the, the supernatural events sort of intervene when something's about to take place that interferes with or supports the prophecy. Oh, my dog. He's talking. All right. So, again, here, just a reminder, because everything's so complicated. Um, we've got Otranto. We've got the subterraneous passage to St. Nicholas. There's the convent. Over here, we have a cave. I think we enter this cave in this chapter. We've got Matilda and her brother Conrad. Um, we've got Peasant, a.k.a. Theodore and his dad Jerome and over here is Isabella at the convent um, this over here by the way is another professor who came in and started erasing my drawing while I was taking a picture of it so say la vie okay let's take a look at the chapter Oops, that's wrong. here we go chapter three so here we are um, at the begin page 66 what's happened so this big parade has come in. The knight says he's from the, um, he's a representative of Frederick of Vicenza, who is Isabella's father. We sort of get at the bottom of 57, Manfred talks about um, how he knows Frederick actually has a really good claim to the throne. So I'll put this back. So um, Frederick has a claim to the throne because he is the relative of Alfonso. And Frederick is Isabella's father. So now we're learning, like, that's kind of why Manfred wants Isabella to marry his son, and now him, is because she is actually related to Alfonso, who is the original Prince of Otranto. Um, so this kind of pisses him off, and then uh, it sort of comes out... Um, Oh, and then the, the knight calls him a usurper, so Manfred gets mad, and he re-imprisons Theodore in a um, tower, and um, sends Jerome to go get Isabella, and um, then we find out Frederick's story, page 58, Frederick's wife had died in childbirth with Isabella, so Fred joined the Crusades, you should look up the Crusades, there's a... Uh, there's a current show on Netflix about the Crusades. It's not very good, but it it explains it's like right around like 11th, 12th century, a bunch of Europeans went to the Holy Land to have war against people in the Holy Land, and it was very violent. This is where like the story of the Holy Grail comes from. If you watch my Monty Python and the Holy Grail, like those are the Crusaders. Um, it was a way of getting like a big reputation too, as like a as a knight. So that's the time period when this is taking place. Remember, Castle of Otranto was written in the 1700s or the 18th century, but remember how Walpole was pretending it was like translated from the Italian, which was found, and it's really a story about people from the Middle Ages because that's what's the most gothic thing. Anyway, so Frederick, after his wife died in childbirth, giving birth to Isabella, he went to the Holy Land, he became a prisoner, um, and then that somehow, uh, you know, reached Manfred's ears, he bribed, this is on page 58, he bribed the guardians of Lady Isabella to deliver her up to him as a bride for his son Conrad. So we're getting a little background on, like, why Isabella was there in the first place. And then he would, like, unite their houses and therefore make his claim more legitimate. All right, so, um, anyway, so then continuing on, uh, and let's see. 
now they learn on page 59, like, Isabella might be missing. Um, this makes everyone really mad. Then, uh, then the parade happens. The, um, knight enters Otranto, and, um, there's the giant sword on page 64, one. The giant sword burst from the supporters and falling onto the ground opposite to the helmet remained immovable. Um, Manfred is really uh, upset by this and um, going on, going on. He thinks he's trying to make everyone like more joyful, but they're just being quiet and solemn. Um, and then he brings the knight into a chamber to have like a little uh, conference, tete a tete. Um, let's see what's important here. Yeah, it's weird because the knight is being silent and Manfred's pretty disturbed. So he's like, okay, let us be sad then. And then Manfred talks about his own claim to Otranto. Um, and we learn that Manfred's father was Don Manuel, who's a prince of Otranto, and his father was Don Ricardo. Um, Don Ricardo was the chamberlain, so he worked for, um, and then we, it sort of gets interrupted, and the knight uh, shakes his head, but just to give you some background, like Don Ricardo was the chamberlain to Alfonso, and we're, lear we're going to learn more about that later, but when, Don, when Alfonso died, Don Ricardo claims that he had given him, man, this is Manfred's grandfather, he had given him um, the castle of Otranto. So Don Ricardo went to the castle. He built St. Nicholas, the church, and the uh, two convents, um, basically out of guilt. All right. So on page 63, uh, uh, you know, he basically, the, the knight's there to reclaim Isabella, and he'll do it with force if he needs to. Um, on page 64, Manfred is saying it was Alfonso's will that Ricardo's lineage takes over um, because Frederick, the rumor goes, Frederick, Isabel's father, died on crusade. Oh, okay. Well, so who else is left? Just him and Isabella to make heirs, and that's on page 65, he calls that the remedy. See, he's just doing what's what's right. And then Jerome comes with news that Isabella has fled. And then the knight is like, why is she leaving the castle in the first place? You know, you were supposed to take care of my daughter. Or, oh, shoot, I think I just revealed something. Anyway, well, you'll find that out. Um... And then, I mean, everything's kind of obvious here, isn't it? So then we're on page 66, and this is all very, like, shaming. The prince, is, uh, Manfred is having trouble concealing all his evil doing. And they decide, here we go, on page 66. Now, turn there. Here we are. We're going to look at this together. Um, thou, traitor prince. Uh, let's see. I'm going to keep drawing with this rainbow here. It's so fun. Thou traitor prince Isabella shall be found. Um, Manfred endeavored to hold him. That's where we are. But the other knights assisting their comrade, he broke from the prince and hastened into the court, demanding his attendance. Manfred, finding it in vain to divert him from the pursuit, offered to accompany him. And summoning his attendants and taking Jerome and some of the friars to guide them, they issued from the castle. Manfred privately giving orders to have the knight's company secured, while to the knight... Oh, someone needs to go out and walk. Come here. While the, to the knight, he affected to dispatch a messenger to require their assistance. So he's like, everyone's going out, right? Um, and he's like, guard the, guard the knight. Okay, this is now the love story. The company had no sooner quitted the castle than Matilda, who felt herself deeply interested for the young peasant. Remember, she liked his voice. She thought he sounded religious. I mean, I don't know. That's always the most attractive quality, but Matilda, that's what she's into. Remember, she wanted to be a nun. 
Um, since she had seen him condemned to death in the hall and whose thoughts had been taken up with concerting measures to save him, was informed by some of the female attendants, the servants, that Manfred, Manfred, her dad, had dispatched all his men various ways in pursuit of Isabella. He had in his hurry given this order in general terms, not meaning to extend it to the guard he had set on Theodore, but forgetting it. Okay, so basically everyone was so excited to um, obey Manfred and urged by their own curiosity and love of novelty. They're like, this sounds more fun than guarding the tower. I mean, that's, to be fair, uh, you know, sound, does sound more fun. Um, uh, there's no one left to guard anyone. So Matil Matilda took advantage of it. She disengaged herself from her women, stole up to the back tower, black tower. Remember how I said earlier, like, all this goth gothic architecture is very conducive to, like, secrecy, right? Um, God, I'm so bad at writing with this thing. Forget it. I'm writing the word gothic. Uh, G-O-T-H-I-C. I don't even need to write that word. But anyway, gothic architecture. Um, boom. So, black... Black Tower. She goes to the Black Tower. Of course, it's a Black Tower. Unbolting the door, presented herself to the astonished Theodore. Young man, said she, through filial duty, that means, like, daughterly, or, you know, if it's a son, it's son duty, and womanly, though filial duty and womanly modesty, woo, I'm so modest, condemn the step I am taking, yet holy charity, surmounting all other ties justifies this act she's like okay this goes against my dad this goes against being a modest woman but charity is more important and i am going to release you she says fly the doors of thy prison are open my father and his domestics that means servants are absent but they may soon return be gone in safety and may the heaven angels of heaven direct thy course thou art surely one of those angels said the enraptured Theodore. He's already enraptured. He's like taken in. None but a blessed saint could speak. See, they both are attracted to each other because they remind each other of like angels and saints. That's pretty funny. Okay, may I not, may I not, I know the name of my divine protectress. Methought thou namest thy father. Is it possible? Can Manfred's blood feel holy pity? Well, yeah, it turns out he, it can. Even Manfred feels pity sometimes, we've seen, because he's a Miltonic uh, villain. But yes, lovely lady, thou answerest not, but how art thou, thou here thyself? Guys, remember, thy and thou just means your and you. So whenever anyone says thou, it means you. It's like tu, tu in Spanish, or tu in French, or tu in Italian. It's, it's the familiar, actually. It's not fancy, it's just old fashion familiar in English. So how art thou here thyself? But it's also like how later writers make themselves sell, sound old and timesy, right? Why dost thou neglect thy own safety and waste a thought on a wretch like Theodore? Let us fly together. The life thou bestowest shall be dedicated to thy def defense. He's like a proper knight. He's like all about defending the women. Alas, thou mistakest, said Matilda, sighing. I am Manfred's daughter, but no dangers... Oh, come here, don't bark. No dangers await me. Amazement, said Theodore, but last night I blessed myself for yielding thee the service of thy gracious compassion. Oh, God, this is like the most boring love conversation. Okay, we're just going to skip ahead. Um, I have never known but calamity until this hour. So this is like the nicest moment of his life. Perhaps this is right here. Perhaps shall never know other fortune again. Suffer the chaste raptures of holy gratitude. He's like, this might be my only, um, moment of joy. Forbear and be gone, said Matilda. How would Isabella approve of seeing thee at my feet? Because she kind of thinks he likes Isabella. Wait a minute. Who is Isabella? said the young man with surprise. Ah, me. I fear, said the princess, I am serving a deceitful one. Hast thou forgot thy curiosity this morning? Thy looks, thy actions, all thy beauty is self? Keiko, don't you see I'm trying to teach a class here? I'm trying to work on you. Thy looks, thy actions, all thy beauteous self seems an emanation of divinity, said Theodore, but thy words are dark and mysterious. Speak, lady, speak to the servant's comprehension. 
he so he they're both confused like she thinks he likes Isabella he doesn't know who anyone is because remember he can't he couldn't see anyone all the girls were all sort of he saw her he saw Isabella in the subterranean's passage but like it was dark because it's gothic okay speak lady speak to thy servant's comprehension like tell me so I understand thou understandest but too well said Matilda but once more I command thee to be gone thy blood which I may preserve will be on my head if I waste time she's like just go or you'll die I go, lady, said Theodore, because it is thy will, and because I would not bring the gray hairs of my father with sorrow to the grave. He's like, I'm not going to die because that'll make my dad die of sadness. Say, but, adored lady, that I have thy gentle pity. Stay, said Matilda, I will conduct thee to the subterraneous vault by which Isabella escaped. She's like, let me take you to the passage underground. It will lead thee to the church of St. Nicholas where thou mayest take sanctuary. What? said Theodore. Was it another and not thy lovely self that I assisted to find the subterraneous passage? He's like, wait, that wasn't you? And she's like, it was not me. It was someone else. But ask no more. I tremble to see thee still abide here. Fly to sanctuary. To sanctuary? No, princess. Sanctuaries are for helpless damsels or for criminals. What is that line? I never thought about this line before. Help! Oh, so only helpless women and bad guys should go to the church. Okay, that's something. Theodore's soul, my soul, is free from guilt. Remember, he said this before. I'm like, I live with no regrets. And I won't look, I won't try to look guilty. Nor will wear the appearance of it. Give me a sword, lady, and thy father shall learn that Theodore scorns an ignominious flight. He's like, this is like not honorable to escape this way ignominious means dishonorable Ooh, i'm gonna write that down put that on a quiz it's hard to say ignominious ignominious it's a good word to know it doesn't come up much but it'll make you sound smart rash youth said matilda thou wouldst not dare to lift thy presumptuous arm against the prince of otranto not against thy father indeed not said it theater so this is where he's like because he's your father now i won't harm him excuse me lady i had forgotten but could i gaze on thee and remember thou art sprung from the tyrant manfred i can't believe that's your dad but he is thy father and from this moment my injuries are buried in oblivion that means like forgotten i'm burying all the injuries he caused me because um he because he is thy father Okay, this is really important, though, because at this moment, a deep and hollow groan, which seemed to come from above, startled the princess and Theodore. Good heaven, we are overheard! They listened, but perceiving no further noise, they both concluded that the event, it was the event of pent-up vapors. And the princess... But basically, like, right here, what's happening is, like, he's like, I won't get revenge because it's your dad. Um, this is the super... Natural. Okay, this is like heaven's like, oh no, you better get revenge. Are you kidding me? This is wrong. Okay, so um, she's giving him advice. Avoid the town and all the western side of the castle till it is there. The search there. So they're out looking for Isabella. Um, go, heaven be thy guide, and sometime in thy prayers remember Matilda. So, like, remember me when you pray. Um, hold on. Keiko, this is really annoying. Come here. I'm gonna walk after this. Okay. Theodore flung himself at her feet, seizing her lily hand, which with, which with struggles she suffered him to kiss. Oh, he vowed on the earliest opportunity to get himself knighted and fervently entreated her permission to swear himself eternally her knight. <gasps> this is like real chivalry stuff here. This is, remember at the in the pre um, preface when he's like, I'm joining gothic with romance? This is classic romance stuff here. This is like, not romance meaning love necessarily, but like the courtly tradition of the knight's um, swearing themselves to the protection of virgins mm. who are the most vulnerable as we all know from this book okay ere the princess could reply i said this before this is important ere means before 
This comes up a lot in literature, and you should just know it. Air, the princess could reply. Like, no one says that ever, but in real life, but it's always in literature, so air, E-R-E, -E, means before. Could be on a quiz. Okay. But before the princess were, could reply, a clap of thunder was suddenly heard that shook the battlements. Therefore, oh, Theodore, regardless of the tempest, tempest is a big word in this book that should be on a quiz. Tempest means storm. I'm writing that down. You know, the tempestuous, like the plume, the sable plumes. That's another thing you should know, sable plume. Black feathers. They're always like stirring up as if they're in a tempest. Theodore, regardless of the tempest, would have urged his suit, but the princess, dismayed, retreated hastily into the castle and commanded the youth to be gone with an air that would not be disobeyed. He's like, okay, okay. He sighed and retired, but with eyes fixed on the gate until Matilda closing it put an end to the interview in which the heart of both had drunk so deeply of a passion, which now, which both now tasted for the first time. They're drinking of the passion of love. They love each other. Theodore went pensively, that means thoughtfully, to the convent to acquaint his father with his deliverance, that he's been saved. There he learned the absence of Jerome and the pursuit that he was making after the Lady Isabella, with some particulars of the story he now first became acquainted. The generous gallantry of nature prompted him to wish to assist her, but the monks could lend him no lights to guess at the route she had taken. So he's like, I have to go protect, you know, he's a, he's a wannabe knight and in romances and chivalric romances. What knights do is they protect virgins, and he knows she's very vulnerable because of Manfred. He So he's going to go find her, but the monks don't know which way. He was not tempted to wander far in search of her, for the idea of Matilda had imprinted himself so strongly on his heart that he could not bear to absent himself much. He's like, okay, I got to go protect Isabella because she's a virgin and she's in danger, but Matilda, ooh, I don't want to go too far. The tenderness Jerome had expressed for him to... for him... Con concurred to confirm this reluctance and he even persuaded himself that filial affection was the chief cause he thinks it's because he loves his dad that he's like hovering it's really because he's in love with matilda um all right until jerome should return at night theodore at length determined to repair to the fort he's like i'm gonna go to the forest that matilda had pointed out so this is part that really reminds me of our good old friend thomas gray um think about you remember he loves contemplating death, you know, sitting in a graveyard. This is a gravestone. And, oh, I've used this word before, but think also about this word that Walpole invented. Gloom. Th. Gloomth. I'm going to put this on a quiz. Gloomth is such a cool word. It's like gloomy warmth. It's like, it's like he kind of takes delight in gloominess which is why like, Walpole liked the Gothic, because it's supposed to be gloomy. Anyway, so Theo wanders into the woods, kind of fake looking for Isabella. Arriving there, he sought the gloomiest shades as best suited to the pleasing melancholy. Remember, Thomas Gray and Walpole were best friends. Uh, Walpole had a painting of Gray in his bedroom, okay? They, they liked that kind of stuff together. Um pleasing melancholy that reigned in his mind so this idea that like his mind was being ruled over by this idea of pleasing melancholy he's sad because he's away from matilda um he's taking pleasure because he's feeling like in love in this move mood he roved insensibly to the caves he's like oh, i'll just go to the caves which had formerly served as a retreat to hermits just like holy men and then we're now reported around the country to be haunted by evil spirits oh dear oops what just happened okay he recollected to have heard this tradition and a being of a brave and adventurous disposition he willingly indulged his curiosity in exploring the secret recesses of his labyrinth labyrinth means like maze all right if this sounds slightly sexual to you um it seems like that to me he's willingly so here he is he's in love and he's going into the secret recesses that means like holes of this labyrinth okay he's like penetrate okay here's this word look this he had not penetrated far into these secret holes okay now this is where students are like come on did he really do this oh yeah we're, 
we, he knows writing. He's talking about exploring secret holes and penetration. Like, they knew what that meant back then, too. This is meant to be, like, sort of sexual-ish. Um, he, remember, he's in love. He's looking for a virgin. This is just sort of like the atmosphere. He had not penetrated far before he thought he heard steps of some person who seemed to be re to retreat before him. So someone's running from him. Theodore, though firmly grounded in all our holy faith and joints to be believed, remember they all think this is a haunted cave, had no apprehension that good men were abandoned without cause to the malice of the powers of darkness. He thought the place was more likely to be infested by robbers than by those infernal agents who were reported to molest and be bewilder travelers. All right. Hold on a second. So, no, we're not walking right now. I'm in the middle of a lecture. Here you go. Um, so, no. Okay. So, here we are. He's retreating into a hole. And he had long burned with impatience to approve his valor. He had long wanted to prove himself. So, he pulls out his big sword. That's what a saber is. Um... Yes, this is like kind of penis imagery, just to be honest with you. He marched sedately onward, still directing his steps as the imperfect rustling sound. So he's like walking into the cave further with his big sword drawn. Um, and then, of course, he finds um, Isabella. She throws herself at his feet. Please don't give me to Manfred. He's like, no, lady. Like, I once saved you from him, and I'm not going to do it again. Okay. And then, um, then they're like, oh, no, what if people found us together? What would they think in this dark hole with your big sword? And he goes, I respect your virtuous delicacy. And, um, he's like, I meant this part's also, like, thinking about... Think about these penetrations and objects and holes. I meant to conduct you into the most private cavity. Cavity means hole. I'm taking you to the private hole in the rocks. And then I, at the hazard of my life, will guard the entrance against every living thing. He's like, I'm putting you in the hole and I will let nothing come into it. So he's literally putting her into a hole. And he's also literally protecting her virginity. This is a lot of over-obvious symbolism going on. I mean, remember, Walpole's very goofy. And this is meant to be overdone. It's like super drama. Besides, lady, continue he, drawing a deep sigh, beauteous and as perfect. He's like, as hot as you are, my soul is dedicated to another. And then at that point... Like, a big noise came, you know, and then at the mouth of the cavern, at the mouth of the cave, at the entrance of the hole, he found an, a knight talking to a peasant who said he saw, so, okay, so he sees this, is this knight, he doesn't know who this knight is, he doesn't know about the knight, um, so of course they get into a sword fight, and then, um, he strikes, the big knight strikes with his, that big saber, his fancy, saber's another word you should know, obviously, plumes, sabers, these are things you should know. A saber is a sword. He strikes at Theodore, but then Theodore um, strikes back at him. They wrote very phallic here. Phallic means like penis symbol. Um, the combat was furious, but not long, and Theodore wounded the knight in three several places and disarmed him. Um, and then the knight fell, whom they soon discovered to be a noble stranger. And Theodore's like, doesn't know that they're on the same side. Um, but he's got, without emotions, pity. But he was more touched when he learned the quality of his adversary and was informed he was no retainer, of, but an enemy of Manfred. Whoops. Yeah, that's right. You just stabbed <sighs> the enemy of your enemy. Um, so he's dying. Someone get a crucifix. And then um, the knight asks, um, are you, art thou Isabella Vicenza? I am, said she. Oh, good heaven, restore thee. Then thou, then thou, said the knight, struggling for utterance. Seest thy father. Oh, my goodness. Theodore has stabbed Isabella's father. The knight is actually Frederick himself of Vicenza. This is bad news for... 
Manfred because he is, you know, owed the castle of Otranto. And here I wrote, oops, Theo stabs Vicenza um, in the phallic sword fight. And Theo and Matilda are in love. Isabel is dad. What a shock. Um, so they carry him. Everyone's crying. They carry the injured knight, Frederick of Vicenza, back to the castle. And thus ends chapter three. What a coincidence. What a co- We did not see that coming, did we? Um, but yeah, that whole chapter is just like phallic symbols. Um, that's a phrase you should know. Phallic F- uh, P-H-A-L-L-I-C Phallic I wrote it up here These are phallic symbols You know, penetrating caves Protecting the entrance of caves This is all romance Chivalric romance These are all terms um, That are good to know And let me write that down Sh- Oops Chivalric romance Oh, this is this formatting is just bonkers. Chivalric romance. Okay, and I'll make sure you guys get a list of all these terms. And I have to go walk my dog. I hope you're doing well and enjoying the book. Just two more chapters to go. Remember, protect the virginity. Find a knight. These are the most important things. Oh yeah, reproduce sons. The lessons of the Gothic. Virgins are in danger. Um, take care and email me.